Let us go ahead and get ourselves started for today. We are going to do two big things today. We're going to pass out the final assignment and kind of explain a little about what we want you to do for that. And we are also going to venture off into the world of quantity takeoff. So we will show you how you can take out the elements of your model and tabulate them and quantify them, associate some costs with them, and start putting together some preliminary estimates for what it might actually cost to go ahead and build your project. Okay. In preparation for the final assignment, it'll be helpful to go ahead and review some of the class videos. And I'm a little behind about putting the videos on the course website, but I'll get the rest of them posted tonight. So in particular, if you're going to be looking at the whole issue of building performance analysis, you may want to look at last, last time's class or two times ago. So we talked about how you could export your models in GBXML and then bring them either into Ecotect and do some analysis or into Green Building Studio. So that might be helpful to go back and review some steps on. Um, if, you wanna, if you head off in the direction of structural analysis, so it was about oh, two weeks ago or something like that, where we exported our model from Revit and brought it into eTabs, something like that. Today we're going to talk about the third aspect, which is uh, doing things for the quantity takeoff. So you know, go ahead and remember those videos are out there to help you get through some of the little pieces as you start working on your own. Okay. In terms of the assignment, let us start there. If you go on out there to coursework and look in either the session 18 or the assignment 5 folder, you will find the description of the assignment as well as a model to look at. So let's go ahead and open both those things up. I'll open up the PDF file containing the assignment. Let's pop that open. There it is. And let me also go through and open the model in Revit. Come over to Windows. You'll find this either out on the coursework drive, or you can also find it out on the L drive if you prefer to look at it there. Out on the L drive, it's in my folder, so Cat's Glen, and it's under session 18. <coughs> Okay, let's let that finish opening up. And I'll do an open. And we'll go out to the L drive. Finally, we'll go down to Cat's Glen. And within there, session 18. And I'll choose the assignment 5 start. And we'll talk a little about what this building is, or what this assignment's all about. That's OK. We'll just take a look at it here. OK, here is the idea. OK, we have gone through and completed the preliminary design for a little building. This is a building that is a mixed use building, something that would probably be built in, oh, I sort of envisioned building something like this down in San Jose in a redevelopment area. So this is something that might show up in a place like Santana Row or just some place where we wanted to have a mixture of uses, some retail on the lower floor. Above that, we have some office space. It could be re uh, residential space. But we're increasingly using a development model that looks something like this, where we have retail and other uses all together. The idea being we can create sort of more lively environments that actually have a little bit of nightlife and stay alive, that they're not sort of single use, single purpose spaces. So this is an example of a little building that can be built in something like that. So the scenario you have to imagine is that a design team has put together a preliminary design for a building like this. And we'll take a look at that building in just a second. And really what we're, where we are in the overall process is we'd like to get some feedback on this preliminary design to guide us as we start going into the next phase of design. So there's really a couple of different aspects. This was all really designed from an architectural standpoint, what we were trying to achieve that way. But the structure is not really very well understood right now. OK, so we'd love to go through and actually start putting in some structural elements, sizing those elements, and really trying to figure out what the structure is going to be like, how that's going to impact what's going on. Okay? 
We'd also like to go through and take a look at this really more from a building performance standpoint. We've put windows in here. We've put different wall surfaces in here. We think that it's going to be, have a, a good sustainable performance. In fact, as part of our design goal, we'd like to be able to feature this as being a very sustainable building that will hopefully be one of its attractions is that for the people who come here and get space here, they can sort of brag that they're in a very high sustainability building. They sort of uh, enjoy the benefits of the natural daylighting and the low energy use. You know, it's really kind of hopefully a selling point for the complex. So we'll look at some of the features in the building that were sort of designed around that uh, to support that. And we'd also like to sort of understand a little bit more about the cost of the building. Okay, right now we're not sure, and we really need to know: is this a ten million dollar project? Is it a fifty million dollar project? Okay, we need a little bit of information to guide us so that we can sort of see, is this building design in alignment with what our budget actually is? And as we approach it at that level, in fact, for all these different levels, it's important to kind of think that about it as, you know, we're not necessarily doing a detailed analysis that's going to be accurate to three decimal places. We just want sort of ballpark figures to guide us through the next phase of design because a lot of early decisions were made here. We're going to keep on refining those decisions. But you know, it's not that we're going to understand is it a 10 million versus a 10 million five building. It's really, we need to understand is it 10 million or 50 million. Okay, and as long as we're in the right ballpark, that'll give us enough information to guide our design so we can specify some more information so we can do a finer estimate on things. Okay, because right now there's really a lot of information missing, so there's a lot of guessing and by gollying and trying to figure out how things fit together, where we have to make some intelligent assumptions and at least put something down because the answer is never zero. It's always something, and we have to kind of put something into the consideration. Okay, let's take a look at the building a little bit first. Okay, um, here we are looking at the outside of the building. You can rotate around it. You'll see that on the southern side of the building, there are a lot of retail storefronts. There's also this kind of overhanging area, which has a lot of glass around it. There's some conference rooms in there that will be shared by the office users. Okay. You'll see that up on the top of the building, there's a little protrusion. That's the top of the elevator core and the stair core. And there's also some skylights up there. Okay. The idea is we'd like to kind of get a lot of natural light down into the building. So we've put some li uh, glass all around the outsides of the building, as well as put these skylights on the top. If you look at the glass and we look at it in some detail, you find that we've actually done some interesting things with the curtain walls. Okay, there's a mixture of sort of solid and glass panels, but there's also a mixture of there's fixed panels and there's these panels here which are awning windows. Okay, so the idea is, and we don't use this so much here in the States, this is much more common in Europe and some other parts of the world where just fixed panels of a curtain wall will actually be able to tilt out or swing out or actually get some natural <coughs> ventilation in there. Because natural ventilation can be very, very helpful whenever we can, as opposed to running the air conditioning all day. Okay? So there's some features like that built into it. If I look at the issue of lighting and how, how these skylights sort of work, it might be helpful to actually go through and look at the building sections. That'll explain a little bit more about what we have in mind. If I zoom in here, you'll actually see there's some skylights up at the top. And there's actually an open shaft that goes all the way down from the roof all the way down to the lobby level. Okay? And at each of the different levels, there's a little railing that wraps around that area to um, basically keep people from falling into that shaft. If I rotate around in the 3D view, let me go back to the 3D view. Actually, I'll go to the section view. Maybe that'll be easier. And I'll orbit this a little bit. Maybe I'll zoom in now. You'll see that what's happening is in the conference rooms, there's actually a glass curtain wall here with doors <coughs> that look out into the lobby area. And then you can sort of see that the light shaft is just beyond that okay, with the railings there. So that is, we're always trying to get some uh, just light coming into the building and let that percolate itself on through. Conference rooms, I think, will actually be pretty good in terms of what's going on for the lighting. I'm more concerned about these office spaces and whether they're getting enough lighting. So we put in some glass doors. Maybe that'll be frosted glass to give some privacy. But even to that interior hall, I'd like some natural daylighting to get in there, as opposed to just doing it all with artificial lighting. In terms of the structure, you'll see that we've actually already placed some architectural columns. There's these round columns that are 18 inches wide, or in diameter, kind of all over the building. Okay, Those are some preliminary guesses about where it might be good to locate them, but you might need to move those based on what you decide your structural scheme will be if you're going to take on that role. 
Okay? There's also some space available here. The floor to floor height is 12 feet. The floor to ceiling height is 10 feet. There's like a little two foot area in there between the ceiling and the floor above. And that's where if there's going to be some structure, we'd like to have most of it concealed up in there. Okay. So we have hopefully concealing some structure up in the office spaces, although we could architecturally decide to leave it open if we want to kind of have that effect instead. Down here on the lower floors, the idea is we'll have some retail spaces on either side of the lobby, and that we're leaving open. So that might actually be sort of exposed beams, exposed ductwork, you know, things that are more open. Or we can close it off later if we decide we want to do that for our tenants. You look at this, oh, let me look at it the other way. The other building section. Okay, here's the lengthwise view. You'll see that the building pretty much mirrors two different sides. We have this retail space down on the lower floor. Up above it, we have these office spaces okay, with some doors already put in there. And if you look at a floor plan, you'll see the idea is, OK, there are the preliminary assumptions about where the columns are going to be. They're on grid lines. These grids are actually 20 feet by 20 feet in most of the different bays, except from D to E. And D to E, they're actually 30 feet apart there. So you can sort of get a sense that this space is about 60 by 60. Okay, we've sort of put in some preliminary ideas about where some hallway walls would be, but really what's going to happen here is based upon the needs of our clients. You know, we can subdivide this space into individual little modules. We could combine two modules, half a floor. Maybe someone who wants to buy, you know, just really rent out the entire space, and we'll reconfigure that as necessary to go ahead and meet the needs of those clients. Okay, so. It really just sort of depends on exactly what's necessary. But as a developer, we're kind of planning, trying to give ourselves some flexibility. Okay. In the center of the building, here's the conference room, wrapping around the kind of light core elevators. There's a stair shaft. And then if you come back here, there's some restrooms. Okay. So a lot of different sort of spaces in there. But it's really, this is all supposed to provide just sort of an interesting starting point for you. Okay. Anything about this design is flexible and adaptable. It's just supposed to give you sort of a good starting point to go with your analysis. And let's talk about what we'd like you to analy analyze. Okay. The idea is, okay, it has these existing spaces, the central lobby, the large retail spaces, and these office suites on the upper floors, as well as this meeting room. Okay. The first round of design's been completed, and what we'd really like to do is have you guys take on the roles of either a structural analysis designer someone who's looking at the building performance and making recommendations, or someone who's going to give us some cost feedback and actually help us understand how this thing's going to be built. So to associate the building elements with a timeline and do a little 4D simulation. Okay. So the important thing starting out is you need to assume, assume one of these roles. You don't need to assume all three of these roles. So think about really which one you want to do, because it really could go either way, or any of those ways. Okay, whether you like to go ahead and kind of look at the structural aspects, the building performance, or the cost side. Choose one, but don't think that you have to do all three. Okay? And depending on which of those roles you choose, your task is going to be a little bit different. But for all of these different roles, your goal is to take a look at that building, analyze the building, make some recommendations about what you're seeing in the building or what you'd recommend improving in the building, and report that back to us. Okay? So that's your role. And again, you're moving sort of at the preliminary design stage, not at the detailed design stage. So the fact that you're going to make some guesses and assumptions and try testing them, and they may not be 100% accurate, is OK. Because really, we're just counting on you to bring your expertise to this. And you know, even if you're not 100% right, that's going to give us enough to get going into the next phase and kind of keep on going with our design. And we'll just keep on successfully working together as a team to kind of narrow down and get closer and closer and keep refining till we come up with a final design. Okay. As a structural designer, okay, to get started, let's start with that. Okay, the assignments out there or the, the folders out there that contains the project file and some preliminary views that have already been set up. Feel free, in fact, take ownership of this model file. Put as many different views in there as you want to. In fact, change the model as you want to based on your recommendations. Really take that and don't think there's anything sacrosanct about that file the way it exists right now. You can go ahead and just change it and do what you need to to get your work done. Okay. If you want to approach it as a structural analysis task, okay, what you'll be doing is things as follows. You'll add some structural elements into it, like foundations and beams and bracing, if you want to think about the lateral side of it. We'll put in some boundary conditions and think about how the joints are connected. 
then put some loads in there. And you can actually sort of recommend what you think the live load should be and what the dead load should be to account for what would be appropriate for a building like this. I'm really counting on you for your expertise there. Okay. Then you're going to analyze the model. You'll take it into a package. That could be ETABS, if you're familiar with that, or robot structure, if you have no prior experience with ETABS, is another good package to work with that we have access to here. But it can really be any of those. But your experience is really all about, ultimately, putting the loads on, analyzing the structure, and then ultimately recommending some sizes for the key framing elements. Okay. Then at the end of the process, what we really want you to do is basically give us back a model that has your sizes in it so we can see really what the sizes need to be, and then we can continue to adjust our design relative to those sizes. We might have to lower the ceilings or change things. We might have to, based on where you put your beams, come up with a different strategy for where we put the HVAC ducts. But we want your input about what the structure might look like so that we can then go ahead and use that as part of our design. Okay. So at the end of it all, give us back a model, as well as give us a report from whatever structural package you're using in a PDF format that shows your analysis, maybe for one floor level. We don't need to see all three floor levels, but just show us kind of what sort of results are coming out of the package for some of the beams, some of the columns. You know, you know, I don't want 50 pages, but just enough to sort of show us what it's working or what's happening in the package in that you know, the sizes that you're recommending are actually meeting the different kind of code requirements that they need to. Okay, so understand the structural side. Yeah. If you're a structural engineer and you're familiar with ETABs, don't feel that you have to go this way. You can go this way, and that's super. I'll welcome you to. If you want to put on someone else's hat and try wearing that for a while, go that way instead. Okay? And if you're not a structure student and you just want to sort of experiment with structure and you're a little bit worried that you won't be able to kind of get all the loads just right, yeah, go ahead and head down that path. Okay, we'll get you some help in terms of trying to bridge you through all that. No one's counting on you to be 100% accurate in your analysis. It's really more we just want to give you the experience of trying and seeing what that's like. And yeah, again, it's, it's OK as we do this. And we ask you to sort of extend yourself beyond your comfort range if, you, you know, if, if you're not 100% comfortable you know, and don't come up with the completely accurate answers. That's OK. It's more about just that you had the experience of going off and trying that type of analysis. If, on the other hand, you think of yourself more as doing building performance analysis, here's the sort of thing you'd be doing. Okay, You'd take the model and you'd add some rooms to it. Most of the rooms are going to be pretty straightforward to work with, but there's a couple rooms like that lobby space that has that light well going up. You're going to have to sort of really give it quite a high room height limit to go ahead and capture all the way up through that space. Okay, So think about how you might want to do that. Okay. In Ecotech, we would like you to go through and do a daylighting analysis. And really what I'm more concerned about than anything is those offices maybe on the second level. Because you know the conference room and the retail spaces, they got a lot of light with all those big plate glass windows. But it's sort of towards the core in the middle that it's sort of you most worry about whether or not you're getting enough light. So take a look. We're going to try and get about 100 foot candles in there so we can say the building is just lit through natural daylight. Okay. If we are meeting that goal, super. We don't have to change anything. If we're not quite meeting that goal, let's recommend some design changes, things that you think would improve the daylighting. You could also look at it if you worry that some of the rooms might be a little bit too bright. We could think about how to add light shelves or fins or just even take out windows. So you know, It's within your range of options to go ahead and change the windows around to whatever you think would be a better way of doing this. Okay. You might also want to change them just for building performance reasons. Maybe that conference room has so much window in it, it's going to be incredibly hard to keep that thing warm. Okay, So go ahead and give yourself the latitude to change things. That's OK. You're really making recommendations about what we would think would actually make the building good, green, and sustainable. Okay, After you go through and look at the daylighting, or concurrently, take it into Green Building Studio also, and let's look at the thermal performance and what we think about the energy consumption will be. So within that, we can take a look at the issue of the building orientation. That's a really easy design alternative to consider. Right now, all that glass is facing south. You can try rotating it 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. Just try different orientations and sort of see if you can come up with a better orientation than just orienting to do south. What will happen is because the windows are a little bit different on the front and the back. So on the front side, we have all that glass. Or on the south side, on the north side, we don't. Okay, So there will be a little bit difference between those different sides. 
and I think you'll actually find that there are some orientations which give you better energy performance than others. Okay, we also want you to think about, and you can test the effect of, oh, different wall materials, different glazing materials. You want to just try and come up with a recommendation for what you think is the right material. And here's the way that'll work. Okay. There's always sort of a declining marginal value to increasing the insulation in something, where you'll get a lot of impact by going through and sort of going from none to a little and then some. But eventually, it starts getting to be the top of the curve. And you'll find that even doubling the insulation has very, very little impact on the actual energy cost. You can over-insulate a building. Okay. So you're paying for a lot of insulation, but you aren't actually getting any benefit. So see if you can figure out what a good material will be and what level of insulation you'd recommend for that. Okay. Also, for the windows and the curtain walls, think about the glazing material there. Should it be single, double, triple? Is it worthwhile? You know, if you put triple in there and we're only saving a few hundred dollars, maybe it's not worthwhile for all the additional cost. Okay, so think about really where we think the good you know, sweet spot is going to be in terms of what the glazing material is going to be. Okay. Out of G Green Building Studio, you'll also be able to kind of come up with some preliminary assumptions about how big the HVAC system needs to be, how much heating and how much cooling we're going to have to provide. And that'll also be useful data to us as we start the next phase of design. So your goal at the end of all this is to update the building model to make the model match your recommendations. So if you come up with a wall assembly that has insulation in it, update the Revit model so it has the insulation in it. Okay. Try and make the model materials match whatever you come up with in Green Building Studio. And then ultimately, you're going to return the model, as well as in the PDF format, there's that one report that comes out of Green Building Studio. It's kind of the front page that really gives you all the data about the projected energy used and the annual cost and the operating cost over the lifetime. Yeah, print that thing out and show us really, here's my recommendation okay, in terms of what Green Building Studio came up with. Okay, so that's if you're agreeing, uh, going at it as a building performance designer. Okay, sort of make sense there? Okay, again, one of your options. Don't think you have to do all of them. I just have one question. Yes? Um, with the uh, renovation, uh, or daylight, mm -hmm. uh, do we assume that the building is in San Jose or is it that? Uh, it said in San Jose, further up in the assignment, something like that. But actually, I'll even give you that as a variable if you want to. If you really prefer, to go ahead and analyze this somewhere very different, okay, based on your your hometown or something like that. Feel free to remote. Or just tell us where you put it. Yeah, you'll find it's actually sensitive to that. It really, is, you know, San Jose again is a very moderate climate. If I put this in Phoenix, the effect of the sun during the summer and what we have to do for the sun would give you a very different result. So uh, go ahead and feel free to relocate the building to wherever it makes the most sense to be an interesting problem to you. Just let us know where you took it. As a final option, if you prefer to think about how this building is going to get built and what it might cost us, we will explore today a tool called Autodesk Quantity Takeoff, which lets us start getting at that answer. Because the idea is there really is a cost to this building, and we're trying to figure out just at a really high level what ballpark we're in. Because if we're totally outside the range of what we have available as funding, we need to go back and kind of revisit the design and kind of pull back in you know, all that glass and all that fantastic stuff I'm trying to put in here. Maybe too rich for our budget. And we need to know just roughly where, where we stand relative to that budget. So we're going to talk today in class about how you can go through and put together what I'll call a preliminary estimate. And we'll even talk about different layers of estimating and what that looks like as opposed to a detailed estimate. Because we don't want you counting every bolt and every nail and every screw. You don't want to really get down to that level. Okay. So there's this whole idea of going through and tabulating all the materials. And then once we've tabulated all the materials from the model, you'll find that's pretty easy to go through and associate some standard costs with them. And there's cost guidebooks, which are very useful for us to actually get started with that. Now, if we've been in construction for quite a while, we have a lot of development experience, what will happen is we'll have a big database of our cost history. So we'll know that for this type of building and this type of construction, here's historically what it cost us to build that. So we'll be able to pull our own data. Okay. For us, here in class, we don't have a big history to draw on. So there are books. There are guidebooks. And RS Means is a real good example of one that's been publishing. They aggregate data from all sorts of projects across the US and really around the world pull it all together, and they try to come up with standardized costs so that 
you have something to estimate with if you don't have a lot of history. Okay? And we can use books like that to actually try to pull in some square foot costs to try and figure out what this thing's going to cost. Okay, again, we'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute about what level is appropriate. Okay, um, the final thing you would do if you were going to go ahead and pursue the constructability path is we'd have you do a 4D simulation showing the proposed construction sequence of the building. Okay, so we'll learn more about that on Tuesday. It actually doesn't take much time. It's sort of a fun, easy thing to do. But the idea is we're going to take the model elements and we take a task timeline. Oh, I'm going to say maybe 10 to 20 tasks. I don't want 200 tasks. Just big tasks like put in the first floor foundation, then put in the structure on the first floor, and then put the walls on the first floor. You know, it's kind of big chunks like that where we can lay out those tasks and then map model elements to that and then run a 4D simulation so you can actually see the thing being built up. And the idea there is that we're just trying to visualize things. Being able to show someone a visualization like that is really, <laughs> it's just very helpful for people who aren't familiar with the construction process because then they can sort of get an idea of really what it's going to look like. And it just helps set their expectation. You know what it looks like, but as I try to explain it to someone else, it's really helpful to kind of show them. Seeing the movie is kind of making, it, it helps them to understand and believe what's going on. OK, so we're going to look at those tools a little bit today. The end point of this is going to be, the report that comes out of quantity takeoff, as well as an AVI movie file that comes out of the 4D simulation. So in terms of what to submit at the tail end of all this, it'll vary a little bit. Each of us will have a slightly different package, which of course makes the TAs nervous, because there's all this different stuff in all these different directions. But everyone should come back with, well, I take that, the first two groups, the structure people and the building performance people, they'll give back a model and some reports that go with the model. Okay, for the people who are going to approach the construction side, they're going to give back some reports that come out of the estimating side, as well as ultimately the AVI movie. Okay, so choose which way you want to go. Okay, and if you want to, it's okay to go ahead and work with someone else, but if you're working in a team, this is meant to be a solo thing, but if you do that, go ahead and pair yourself up with different disciplines. So I'd like to sort of have a structure person working with a performance person, or a structure person working with an estimating person, something like that. Like, don't just, just sort of duplicate the same thing, OK? Because you'll find if you're not familiar with structure, and someone in structures would like to do some building performance analysis, and you'd like to draw on them to help you understand the structural side, yeah, it's really the way multidisciplinary teams work. So feel free to do that. OK, does that sort of make sense at a high level? OK, beautiful. This is all going to be due on Friday the 3rd at midnight. When the TAs will be sitting here dutifully checking you in. Not really. But it's uh, go ahead and put it on the course course site by Friday at midnight, and we should be in good shape. That's the end of dead week. So there's assignment five. Again, go ahead and take advantage of the videos that are out there, because we'll put the rest of them out there. And, you know, there's no doubt something that went by too fast as we were doing Green Building Studio or working with GBXML. And it'll be helpful to go back and take a look at some of those things.